are watching West Harper Community yeah. Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. For the community, by the community. Welcome to our talks. I'm the host, Joanne Bauer, and this is the show where we talk to artists about their art and about the process of creativity. Today, I'm very honored to have two guests who are uh, different. One is a visual artist and one is an author, so different from one another. And um, we're going to start with Nan Rundy, who's to my left. And Nan is an artist whom I happen to know from the West End neighborhood. And she's very prolific. I also know her from the West Hartford Art League. So welcome, Nan. Thank you, Joanne. Happy to have you here. Uh, I thought we would maybe talk uh, first a little bit about the West Hartford Art League, and in, because that is our West Hartford mm -hmm. connection, of course, and an upcoming show that they have that you're involved with, and I am also, and it's called 80 Days of Art. So tell me a little bit about your involvement with 80 Days of Art. Well, I'm one of the 80 artists who's exhibiting in that show. So each of us has one piece. Uh, the piece that I'm showing is um, in front of us here. And right, it's one that you brought today. And it, this is one of your graphite uh, yes. pieces. So this, I love your work, Nan, and you've recently won uh, a prize at the Art League for something similar, or was it this piece? I did, it was for us? this piece. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Thank and you for bringing show. your prize winner here today. <laughs> So there's something quite magical to me mm -hmm. about about these images. They mm -hmm. they almost seem well. I know you use the word atmospheric for some of your mm -hmm. your your oils and your egg tempers, but these seem to me atmospheric too. I don't know. There's a quality. What, how would how would you describe them? I started these as studies because I wanted to be able to incorporate bird images in my more abstract work, but oh. they took over my life, basically. So I've been doing one after another. Um, I when think they've become more of a meditation, oh. partly yeah. because they take so long, layer on layer on layer. So let's just back up for a moment when you say for our audience audience when you say a study you mm -hmm. would be wanting to focus in on something in in a more focused minute way that you might incorporate in a larger picture yes and mainly what i was after was to be able to internalize the the forms of birds not just the shape of a bird so that it looks the way a bird should but I'm fascinated with uh, the patterns that just happen spontaneously, the way things grow, the shapes of feathers, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think usually when people talk about studies, they're talking about quick sketches. Right. Um, but right. for me, these became an end in themselves. Yes, and, and that is so obvious to me when you mention the word meditation. That seems to perfectly capture because this this is just magical and and we will have a, a close up so our audience can see it a little more clearly because of course with the graph I it's it's light it's light on the page yes but yeah. the oh my goodness the expression in the eye of the bird is, is just amazing how how long would it take you to do a piece like this weeks and sometimes months. Um, the one in front of me here 
took a very, very long time. It's difficult building up the darks to any degree of intensity and still maintain the, the texture, and the texture is important to me. And the delicacy, you know, these are quite delicate pieces to, to my way of thinking. Um, so when you, so it, maybe our audience would be curious, I know I am, when you talk about building up the darks, for example, uh, to, the, um, to the right here, we have some darker area in the feathers, and of course the mm -hmm. eye is darker. Is that layered? Oh, definitely, yes. Wow. Um, what I did, though, with this one was establish the darkest point with the eye, and then the rest of it had to basically rise to that level, which it took a very long time. But um, because it takes so long, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, various aspects of the drawing and the whole idea of, of that bird's gaze to me was riveting. Normally you're not close enough to a bird to be able to to look it in the eye but I had the feeling as if I were entering into this this um, presence, this intelligence. Wow and I, I would have to say that that comes across you know, it's almost as if, it's almost as if looking at this piece, mm -hmm. we just left a conversation with the bird. Do you know, it's almost as if we were talking and then he looked in that mm -hmm. certain, I don't know, a scant way. <laughs> so yeah. when you commit to a, a, an intense study like mm -hmm. that, I would guess, I'm only guessing though, that it takes you away from some of your other pieces. Do you know if you were, how, how do you balance the weeks that you might spend or months doing this in relation to your, your larger oil pieces and your egg tempras? I think the short answer is I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the, I try to. <laughs> Uh, sometimes I do better than others, and sometimes it has to do with something as um, simple as the weather, um, oh. or um, what else is placing demands on my time. These drawings I can pick up anytime and work on them. A painting is, um, for me, a major commitment of time, especially my egg tempera paintings. And I would like to talk a bit about egg tempera because not everyone is as familiar, I would think, with egg tempera as they are That's with acrylics or, art, uh, acrylics or oil paintings at this point. So tell us, a egg tempera has quite a history, doesn't it? It does, and it goes back at least as far as the Middle Ages. Um, it was the primary painting medium until oil painting was developed. And I suspect that one reason you don't see more egg temper painters now is because the process is so involved. There are reasons <laughs> why, <laughs> why people turn to oil paints. <laughs> you, you have to mix up the paints fresh every time. So, why, and why is it referred to as egg tempera? Is there egg in it? There is egg in uh -huh. it. So egg is the binder instead of oil. Okay, and so then when you say you have to mix the paints, you're, are you mixing paints into egg yourself? Or? Yes, using dry pigments. Dried pigments. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not very familiar with it. I think I've maybe seen it done somewhere, but... I'm sure you've seen it done, but um, what you've seen probably also looks very different from the kinds of pieces that I do. Mm -hmm. Andrew Wyeth is maybe oh, the best known okay. egg temper painter and he okay. worked so wonderfully realistically wonderful detail okay. um do you feel that egg that tempera allows for more detail is that part yes. of why you choose it it does because generally and this was the primary way of working in the middle ages i think to use a very very fine point uh, brush okay. And that's what and you do stroke also. by stroke. I do some different things with it. Um, the way I was taught incorporates 
both the, the Western medieval method and the Byzantine method, which starts with wash layers, almost as if you're doing a watercolor painting. And I keep that part of the process going as long as I can because um, I don't know what's going to happen. Wow. And I like to be surprised. Wow. <laughs> and I let that process tell me where the painting is going to go. It's about as far from <laughs> this kind of work as you can get. Right. And they, those two processes for me balance out really nicely. And you know, what you're describing is, is two different processes. And I think when the audience would see your two pieces, this compared to the egg tempera, that would be obvious too, that the egg tempera has a very mystical, I would say a very mystical quality to it, your, your art does. And I think one reason is that um, somewhat like the graphite drawings, it's built up by layers. Mm -hmm. And the layers are transparent. Even when I'm working with opaque paint, you never entirely lose what's underneath. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll put figures in early layers and let them just subside below the later layers, but you get oh. hints of them, mm -hmm. ghosts or... And for me, um, that adds to um, the fascination because it gives me a sense of the past, of, of um, I'm fascinated with ancient cultures. So often you might see hints of um, ancient calligraphy or oh, no. figures that suggest very distant times. Uh -huh. um, I, I like to create a feeling of um, a great expanse of time or depth. So when you might have a figure or some kind of, kind of form in an earlier layer, would, would that also be part of what might emerge later? You, you said that sometimes the painting or oftentimes the painting will dictate so that you might see that that one figure needs to become more prominent? And that's true. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I keep um, redefining it or letting it um, dominate the painting even, just because it wants to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, other times I decide it's got to go. It's got to go. <laughs> <laughs> so then when you say it's got to go, it comes lost, I would assume, in layers over it. Yeah, it's like right. a distant memory. Like so a distant there's, there's memory. A hint, <laughs> but it's not domineering. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, am I correct in saying this, Nan? You, you very, very recently graduated from the Old Lyme Academy, yes. correct? Were you doing art before that time? Not really. As a child, yes. Uh -huh. uh, through high school, yes. Uh -huh. And in college, I had been an art major oh. for a while uh -huh. and I was very quickly disillusioned with that. Um, you'd go into a class and the teacher would say, express yourself, and then tell you how horribly you were doing. Oh yeah, who needs that? <laughs> but right? no, no technique, nothing. And uh, I wanted to learn the basics. And apparently that wasn't an option in those days, so I wound up an English major. Okay, and, and so a then freelance writer. And a freelance writer. Yeah. Which of course is a creative process yes. too. Um, and we'll talk more about writing a little later in the show. But I'm curious then what brought you back to art? Was it a, a, a drive, a need? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It partly was unfinished business. I thought this was something I wanted to do. And I didn't follow through. But also I was working on a, on a um, project having to do with chaos and mm -hmm. I was feeling the limits of language mm -hmm. and I thought I need mm -hmm. to work in a new language, a visual language. Well certainly 
the world would have lost a lot if you hadn't gone back to the academy oh, because you. you you are very very talented i i just want to say right now that we uh, anyone wanting to purchase your piece that will be part of the 80 days of art can do that actually online i think right now but uh, the exhibit will take place at the West Hartford Art League from September 14th to October 11th, and there will be a wonderful reception on September 14th from 2 to 4. Okay. And I do want to briefly mention now, and we might come back to it a little later, that in our neighborhood, in the West End of Hartford, mm -hmm. we will have Art Around. This will be the third year, correct? The third official year. The third official year, <laughs> <laughs> right, of Art Around, which is yes. an opportunity for people to come to different homes in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and to see art. What's different this year, new and, new and different? This year we're doing two days of open studio uh, instead of just one partly to give artists the chance to see what their uh, fellow artists are doing, but also um, obviously because some people have schedule conflicts and last year complained that they had to miss it all together or just wanted to be able to see more of what the artists were doing. Do you have any idea how many artists will be participating this year? It's a little soon to say for this year. Last year I think we had about 20 but we're always reaching out to more people because not everybody knew about it. Mm. Right. So we have, a, we have a new website this year, oh, uh, nice. artaroundthewestend.com. Right. And uh, we're and hoping that that gets that. the word out better. You created yes. the website, yes. right? So that's September 27th and 28th from 11 to 5. And yes. that's going to be in the West End of Hartford. And so now what I would like to do is to introduce our second guest whom I met in a West End location and Dana Rondell yes. is with us this evening and today and she met met me at Passages Gallery which is a wonderful fixture in the Absolutely. neighborhood of, of the West End and Dana would you like to just tell us a little bit about you've brought some books with you and you're obviously a writer and an author yes. and I'm, I'm very pleased to have an author because we mm -hmm. haven't usually, you know, at, to this point on Art Talks, we haven't talked to many authors. So welcome, and uh, what would you like to talk about? Which book first? Um, either book is fine. Since we're talking about the creative process and um, art, visual art, we can probably start with a children's book. The, okay, um, wonderful. Yeah, the Sunflower and Rose was actually um, illustrated by a local author, a young man named Andre Rochester. And I think he did an absolutely wonderful job. He's from Harford. Was he part of, of um, I think I met him. Was he? You probably have. I know he's been a part of a number of the um, art venues. Open um, studio. Open studio. Right, I yes. did meet him and mm -hmm. I did see this book before. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. So what is that collaborative process like? Well, what, the way it started is I asked Andre um, if he could draw a picture of a sunflower. A sunflower happens to be one of my favorite flowers. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, I can do that. So he drew an animated uh, sunflower for me. Animated? Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, with the face and, and um, a little bit of movement um, uh -huh. and it was a still image but you could see movement in, right. in the visual image right and he brought that back to me and that was basically um, to determine whether or not we would move forward together right and I absolutely adored the mm -hmm. sunflower that he drew for me and once um, I saw it I said absolutely I would love for you to to draw the illustrations for the rest of the book mm -hmm. And so he said, absolutely. He was um, happy to do that for me. And I was happy to have a young local artist um, from the area right. be able to participate in this experience with me. So that in and of itself was actually, um, it was just awesome to yes, have that. Yes, that's great. So he did that. And the process was basically to um, have sessions um, maybe every other week or, or something, uh -huh. sometimes longer, um, uh -huh. when he had questions for me or when he was finished with 
um, one page of the book, um, the illustrations for that page, because the illustrations, depending on um, the complexity of the drawings mm -hmm. and the colors that were required, took longer than some mm -hmm. of, of the other mm -hmm. pages. So after each page, we would get together and talk about it and see if it was what I was looking for. <clears throat> now you had, I'm assuming you had written the whole story I beforehand, did. and then you were shopping around for an illustrator? Well, I did uh, talk to a couple of people, including in the New York area. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I said, I thought it would be a great idea, considering I'm from the area, to work with someone who was local. Right. So I was really happy that Andre was introduced to me. And once introduced to me and I found out that he could draw the way that he uh, draws, I said, absolutely, I would love I see what you mean about animated, the animated yeah. face of the sunflower. Yeah. <laughs> it's very expressive. Absolutely. Um, so was this one of your first books, Dana, or, or not? I know you told me you've written a few books, and this well, is a children's book. Well, actually, this book, book um, was already completed, I should say, without the illustrations when I was in grad school. Okay. I was taking a dance therapy class, dance uh -huh. movement therapy uh -huh. class. And one of the projects, final projects that we had for the class was to create a book. Um, we were uh, in discussion about how creative movement and dance, music, et cetera, could help individuals with autism, et cetera. And what I wanted to do is write a story that included um, those modalities, whether it be dance, um, whether it be singing, uh -huh. whether it be um, any kind of movement and music, uh -huh. um, so that we could use those particular modalities in written form and in visual form to help individuals move beyond whatever those limitations they might have had. And so that's how the book initially came about. The book was um, completed, uh, but I made edits to it when I decided that I actually wanted to publish this book because I thought that with the work that I do in the community anyway, it would be a great first children's book. Mm -hmm. And so I went ahead and I made the edits that I wted, which was maybe three, four, or more than that, maybe five years actually right, later. Right, editing is so much a part the of the initial process, book. right? <laughs> and once I, I completed the edits, that's when um, I met Andre, sometime after that. I and I, I think it's fascinating. To me, it's fascinating what you're talking about, the, um, the, the col collaborative process of, of the arts, the inter-arts. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's 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 what's happening, of course, um, in the art scene around Hartford. Mm -hmm. And I love this page because we we have the m music symbols going across yes. the page too. I see that in the back of the book, you you have a CD or a DVD. Yes. What would what would be on this? Well, what I did is I got together with. Um, a local musician. Uh, actually, he's the music director of Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun. He's a Native American, mm -hmm. and Kenny, um, Kenny Merrick and Junior. And he came and worked with me to create music that would go along with the story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I wanted to do, because I love um, our relationship with nature, mm -hmm. and being Native American, I know that they have a very, very deep relationship with nature, and I wanted to make sure that that was include it within the music. And mm -hmm. so what we did is within the story, I actually have not only the sunflower come to life, but I have nature come to life. I have mm -hmm. the trees come to life. I have a bird a chirping coming to life and creating music. So there are various aspects of nature itself that comes alive to create music. Mm -hmm. And I wanted Kenny to complement that. Mm -hmm. uh, he did use uh, the flute as mm -hmm. well as handmade flute. Um, mm -hmm. Indian Native American flute mm -hmm. and also hand drum. So he used nice. those instruments to create this beautiful, beautiful music that you could actually dance to. Oh, that's wonderful. I wanted to ensure that the um, audio book, which includes the music, allowed children to get up and dance and clap and sing together. Excellent. And for us adults to also participate in that experience. So that leads me into what I want to say about your other book here. This is, I think this is your newest, is it? It's my newest and uh, number seven, actually my seventh book. Your seventh book? Yes. And I was, you have on your, on your website 
um, a, a chapter that someone can read, which I looked at, and I have to say that even three sentences in, I was feeling uplifted and inspired. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so that seems to be quite a bit of your orientation in the yes. world. Tell us a little bit ab about how you've come to this kind of writing and what you want your audience to take away. Well, actually, it was in 93. Um, I enjoyed writing prior to that, but I don't think I actually thought about being a, a full-time writer until some time after. I graduated from college in 93, and it was sometime during um, or subsequent to graduating that I started to be introduced more to, to inspirational, motivational writing. Um, I had the opportunity to attend a, suppos a symposium in Farmington, and there was uh, Dr. Dennis Kimbrough, who's a motivational writer and speaker. Um, I heard him speak, and his language was so lyrical. And um, his book, Think and Grow Rich, um, a version of Napoleon Hill's book, I think Napoleon Hill, right? Think and Grow Rich? I think that's Napoleon. I've heard is of it. Is it Napoleon I, Hill? I'm not sure if, who the author I'm, is. I've well, one of the, the, the um, all-time motivational writers. So it was taking a version of his book, Think and Grow Rich, but it was Think and Grow Rich, a black choice. And it was actually written for, for the um, black community, I would say, but anyone could read it. But that was his target audience. And what he wanted to do was just motivate people and to um, cause people to think differently about life and about how we create our life and our life experiences. But what I took away from it was that his language the way he, um, the energy that was transmitted from his language. And that automatically made me feel like if words, if language could transform our lives in that way, because I felt very much, you know, mm -hmm. transcended, you know, mm -hmm. like transcending that moment that I was in wow. to the next moment, I said, this is something I would love to do. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, I was attending uh, grad school, mm -hmm. and I was... Um, starting my career full-time. Well, I had just started a full-time career in information technology. I was in computer science, information technology, so I was a computer engineer. And here I am in this new career um, in computers, but wanting to become a full-time writer. So I actually spent my time from 93 up until um, 13 years later, believe it or not. I attended grad school, um, focused on creative writing, and dance, um, two things that I love to do. And just uh, continually immersing myself in this whole process of writing, but from an inspirational perspective. Right. I wanted to write from a, a very spiritual perspective, right. from that inner self perspective. And I felt like it was that type of writing that would really, really move people beyond wherever they, they were in their lives, because and I know how it moved me. And I think that it, it's, it sounds like it's really, truly a mission for you, Dana. We don't have much time left, okay. but I want you to really pl tell people where they can get your book. They can go to your website, correct? Yes, uh, Rise and Reach, along with all my other books, are available at Barnes & Noble, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon. Uh, you can also go to my website, either Partners in Goodwill, Partners in Goodwill spelled exactly the way um, okay. it, it's supposed to be spelled, okay. uh, partnersingoodwill.com, okay. or you can go to uh, my church's website, which is Wisdom in New Dimensions, um, spelled exactly like that, Wisdom in I N Dimensions dot org. WisdomInDimensions.org, and we yes. have the card here we can focus in on. Well, thank you both so much for coming in today. I, I want to quickly plug my book because I'm going to be reading um, at WordForge in Hartford on October 6th, and that starts at 7 o'clock um, okay. at Billings Forge. And so we have um, authors today and, of course, our visual artist, Nan. Thank you very much for being here, and thanks to my producer and to the uh, camera people and to Jitu Huntley who's um, the station manager. We'll see you next time for Art Talks.